um, for this session, we will have opportunities to listen to talk provided by Professor Q Min Chao from Coventry University and uh, uh, Professor Do Sam Huang from South Korea. So first, I would like to introduce um, Professor Ku Min Chao. Uh, Professor Ku Min Chao, he come from Coventry University and by the way, you know that we have Nguyen uh, Thanh University and Coventry University have very good joint uh, degree program uh, uh, between the two universities with very good you know, results. So, <clears throat> so um, you know, Professor Chow um, got his uh, Master of Science and PhD degrees from uh, Sunderland University uh, in uh, 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 1993 and 1997, respectively. And after that, he uh, worked for the uh, Engineering Design Center in Newcastle, Upper Thai University, uh, as a research uh, associate fellow for many three years before he uh, finally he joined Coventry University, a senior lecturer in uh, uh, the year 2000. And after that, he spent three years working, uh, working for the British Telecom Research Lab as a short-term research fellow. And his research uh, interest in, includes uh, the areas of uh, intelligent agent, service-oriented computing, cloud computing, and big data, etc., as well as the application such such as energy efficiency management and green um, manufacturing. He has over 150 uh, refereed uh, publication in books, in journals, in uh, conference proceedings. He, he also the one who founded the, and is the managing ed editor for the uh, Springer Journal and, uh, service-oriented computing and application. And more importantly, he uh, sit on a number of um, editorial boards for a number of international journals. And he served a number of international conferences by taking different uh, responsibilities as uh, general chairs, as uh, program chairs, and, and as structures. Please join me uh, in welcoming Professor uh, Ku Ming Chao from Coventry University to deliver his paper on, on cyber physical system for future higher education. Please. Um, first of all, thank you very much for Section Chair, uh, very kind introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here and to share my, my uh, uh, humble views on uh, at University 4.0. And today, the focus will be from different point of view, uh, slightly different, anyway. It's from cyber physical systems, more from engineering for me to get the whole thing, really. So this is uh, 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 the outline of today's talk, really. I will get started with uh, a brief introduction about the uh, higher education sectors in the UK uh, and to say the scene or give it a context, why University 4.0 becomes so important uh, to the UK. And after that, I, I presume there's some people probably uh, uh, you know, still confused what uh, cyber physical system is. So I just give a brief introduction, I clarify what I think, what it means. And of course, I think we're going to key uh, back to the most important part. It's the uh, cyber physical system in higher education. How we apply the cyber, cyber physical systems to improve the uh, higher education in terms of teaching, administrations, even research. 
And in the end, okay, and uh, all the last part really, uh, I will spend some time to talk about uh, uh, a claim project which is funded by the European Union. Been, I've been working with a number of uh, uh, researchers from different universities within the EU and on e-learning. And so to share some experience with you guys. And of course, in the end, I will just give a brief uh, summary of uh, the talk and uh, draw a brief con conclusion as well. Okay, right, let's start with the higher education in the UK, okay, and it depends on how you look at the, uh, how you define the higher education in the UK. Roughly, we have a 130 university, and uh, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, established time, okay, we can roughly divide into four tiers. Uh, the first tier, okay, is ancient, you know, uh, means uh, 13th century, like Oxford University, or 19th century, uh, like uh, uh, Edinburgh or Glasgow, I'm sorry, and like uh, Durham. And uh, then we have a red brick university, that means uh, was established during the uh, Victoria time, like Birmingham University, Leeds, Sheffield, and Liverpool universities, etc. And in the 60s, okay, a uh, large number of universities have been uh, established. Uh, for example, like Newcastle, Keir University, York, um, Warwick, and Bath University as well. So there's you know, 60 universities. And, and the last wave, okay, is post-92, and that uh, including Oxford Brookes, Coventry University, Portsmouth. And even after 2000, we still have a few universities uh, that have been established. So it's, uh, it's quite a large number of universities we have. Okay, right, so um, before 2000, and um, before 1997, okay, uh, it's a free education for the UK students to attend the uh, university, to receive the degree. Until, 2000, uh, until 1998, the, the tuition, tuition fee was first introduced, and that will be equivalent, and that will be received one thousand pound. You have to pay, sorry, you have to pay one thousand pound to it, not equivalent to roughly one thousand and three hundred US dollars a year. Okay, in 2006, okay, they increased two thousand pound. And uh, the big change, okay, in 2015, to £9,000. Okay, right, and of course, the overseas students, which is non-EU students, or the EU students, okay, we consider as home students, so they pay exactly the same fee as home students. And the overseas students here, we're talking about is non-EU students, okay, so we have different um, fee schemes. And normally, they are far more expensive, but nowhere near like nowhere near like the United States, okay, so it's still far more cheaper. Okay, right, so um, because the government found the research, I uh, found the uh, higher education, so the, num the government have a limited funding, okay, so they cut the number every university that they can take in. In other words, okay, Oxford, Cambridge, they can take certain number of students every year. They cannot exceed number. If you exceed number, we get penalty by the government. So this applies to all the universities in the UK. Until 2015, they dipped the cup because this nice alum pound basically can cover the cost of the university to run. So in reality, okay, since 2015, all the universities, even we still think they are public universities, but in real term, it's a private universities. Okay, so there's no cup. Uh, the number they look up on the number of students you can take. So Oxford, Cambridge, they can take as many students as they like, as they think is appropriate. They are capable of doing it. Okay, Coventry can do the same thing as well. Manchester can do the same thing as well. So it become a stick competition between these universities. So some universities are expanding, some universities are shrinking, close to the campus, close to the courses since 2015. Okay, where would get the money? Okay, the money we have to um, to chunk the money. Okay, we can get from the government. Uh, one okay is called research exercise framework. Uh, this decide roughly 1.7 about 1 million pound a year. How the UK uh, research council distribute the money to all the universities. Our UK government, okay, don't have uh, like, you know, uh, selected universities, so okay, you know, like the previous talk, selected university, then we get special funding to it, uh, not a block funding to it, and we don't do that. We based on your research output. 
and then based on the output, then you digit the money. Okay, and then this, the last exercise was 2014. And then the next exercise will be 2021. 20, so this, uh, and then, then depend, uh, and the, uh, yeah, it depends on your research result and how much you're gonna get out of this one million pounds a year, the proportion of it. Okay, right, um, earlier I mentioned about the tuition fee, okay, uh, we, start in, we start to increase uh, the tuition fee to nine thousand pounds, but also based on the inflation rate. And the UK government tried to relax the tuition fee uh, for the university. They, 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 in, the, in the moment, it's the UK government put a cap on it, so you can increase over the, uh, over the uh, inflation rate. So now what are going to do, okay, they come up with this called teaching excellence framework. So that assess the university uh, teaching, quali teaching quality or the student's experience. Well, there's some number of criteria anyway. And to say, okay, then give us three different category, gold, silver, or brown. If you get a gold, then you can increase your teaching fee by X amount. If you're brown, well, you cannot. Okay, so, so that, it's, uh, that will again have a significant impact on the, uh, on the, the income for the university. So really. Okay, and the other, the other, the other important uh, indication, okay, for the university is the National Student Satisfaction Survey, which will have a significant impact on, on the teaching excellence excellency uh, framework result as well. But later on, I will talk about the a number of other rankings, which could also uh, have a certain impact on the, on the uh, um, student intake or the student income uh, or university income. Okay, right, so as, so as I mentioned earlier, okay, and there's no cap uh, on the university the number of students you can take. So it become very stiff, okay. And then, uh, and then the students, okay, they, the way they look at that we have uh, roughly uh, 2.8 million students uh, a year, really, uh, and to, join the, uh, to join the higher education sector. So a lot of students are okay, confused with which university they should go to. So that normally they look into all these uh, uh, rankings, really, from the newspapers, of earlier, you know, from this uh, uh, QS or this uh, the THE, or different kind of uh, rankings. If you look at that, and uh, and once in okay, once in they also, once in no matter what happened, okay, one of uh, uh, important criteria is take the student experience into account, and not including like a competi completion rate. How, how the students satisfy your course, uh, how many get employed within six months after you graduate. Either you go to, you get a job uh, in a, a good company, or uh, you go for the higher education, that means master's degree or PhD degrees. Okay, then we have a, a number of uh, uh, rankings, okay, uh, the Times, the Guardian, and the Higher Education Times, etc. Okay, they all, as, you know, as previous, previous speakers say, that they all based on uh, different criteria, and even the same criteria also have different weightings. So they come up all different um, uh, list of top universities, really, in the UK. So unfortunately, okay, a university have to pay attention to all this ranking, doesn't matter what it is, because the students, this will have a big impact or influence on how the way the student choose which university or which course they want to go to. Okay, right, so university have been forced really, got to be very agile, adaptive, and then uh, got to make the uh, staff very efficient. And uh, the other important thing is you need to digitalize everything really. Okay, right, so basically I just give you, give you Broad overview, you know what uh, UK higher education sectors in the moment, and the next one I'm going to uh, talk about is the CPS, uh, Cyber Physical Systems. Okay, um, I think uh, this is a, a quite a, a, a famous picture, really. An elephant, a blind person touched the elephant depends on which part it touched. So you know, come up with different ideas of what the elephant looked like. So what I'm trying to tell you, okay, there's no consensus on the definition on, or over this uh, uh, CPS, really. 
So different people give different views on it according to their own experiences, depends on their purpose really. Okay, right, the term okay is not really not new, it's 10 years old really, at least. Uh, this is stuff from the NFS really in the United States because the NFS uh, at the time, I think it was a chief engine, chief scientist uh, advisor to uh, Clinton will come up with this uh, term, say look, uh, the United States government should start to fund these uh, research directions. And then funny enough, okay, at the time, uh, all the European Union really didn't pay too much attention to it. At the time, it was more focused on this, uh, because under, under the framework seven, uh, still focused on this uh, um, embedded system, real-time system, rather than CPS really. Okay, right, so, so what I'm trying to tell you, okay, the United States take a step ahead on this area. And, uh, but what is a CPS, okay, and from their definition, okay, basically they think it's an engineering system that are built from and depends on the seamless integration of computational algorithms. So basically it's algorithm and the physical components is between the software and the hardware, really. So they will think, okay, the advance in the uh, CPS will be able to push the capability, adaptability, and scalability, and resistance, safety, security, and usability. And now we're far exceeded simple embedded system to today. So the Europe, that's what I'm saying, the European Union was a bit behind on, in this particular area. Uh, the important bit, okay, the last, I like the last statement in this slide. The CPS technology will transform the way people interact with engineering systems. Just as like internet has transformed the way people interact with information. It, uh, the internet has changed the way how we access to information, how we use the information. And then they believe CPS will play the same role like, uh, like internet. Okay, right, here is an example, okay, uh, of physical, uh, physical assets uh, such as device, sensors, and that interact with machines or human in the real world. As you can see, uh, I want to make sure. Okay, so this, this is the physical world here. So we have a PC and everything. Okay, then we have a mirror digital world, uh, which is a cyber twin to the physical world. So exactly the same thing, okay, it's just mapped to that, but this one, a future one, virtual one, virtual one. Okay, right, so the, basically the, uh, the virtual one receives the data from the sensors um, from the uh, physical one and process it become information for the decision maker to decide if there's any fur further action you need to take. Okay, once you, you make any, once you pass the message or pass the control to, to instruction to the physical uh, devices, they will change the behavior, change the state, which will back to the virtual world again. We provide with new data, new information, and then the decision maker system can base on that to, uh, to reason over that, uh, sorry, can base on that to reason over that and uh, to make recommendations. So basically it's a loop. So CPS basically it's a, uh, it's a smart system that co-engineer interact, interacting network of physical and, compo and computational components. And, uh, and this system will provide a foundation uh, of our critical infrastructure from the basis of, of emerging and future smart devices. And that important bit is uh, will improve our quality of life really in many ways. And basically, the CPS involves three disciplines, really. The computational software, control over the machines or physical and systems. The system sits between the communication and control. And then the communication between the, communica uh, between the computation system and physical is through this uh, uh, cyber system, really. And the common components they have is, uh, is, uh, is the information. So this is how the three disciplines interact and uh, how they fit that back to each other. Okay, right, so now we come down, sorry, uh, probably the quality of the picture's okay. Uh, I might not be able to read the small print, but basically I'll just uh, uh, quickly go through. If you look into this uh, um, uh, CPS, okay, instead of uh, three uh, big blocks, three big components, we can break it down to five different layers. Not help, uh, help you to understand uh, and how it works or what its potential is. 
Okay, right. So I think the, this two dimension we look into is from function point of view and the attribute point of view. Okay, the, the bottom layer is a smart connection layer and uh, label, and then the one level up is data to information con conversion label, and then further up is a cyber label, and further up is connection label, and then the last one is on the top, which is a configuration label. Okay, the, the smart label here, remember this is more for engineering, so imagine that, uh, you know, it's a factory, so you want to turn into uh, a smart factory, so that is the, that is the thing you want to do. So what you want to really have a block and uh, you allow the, uh, uh, to, to allow uh, the, all these sensors, all these devices can plug and play. Okay, and then they can, uh, they can, they can uh, talk to each other through the uh, communication lines. And then they have a sense uh, where stop your sensor network. So for the data, okay, uh, data to information, and they should have uh, some smart analytic software for, for components to analyze the components and, or the machine health. And uh, they also be able to uh, collect different, different data and then to map that out uh, among these uh, multiple dimension uh, data really. And then they can do some predictions, for example, for the degradation or maybe some uh, performance. Uh, in the cyber layer, okay, uh, basically it's the, uh, the twin model for the components and the machines. So the time machine for radiation identification and the memory. So, so basically they can use the information regret or data simulation model to simulate what happened. Okay, the connection level, okay, so basically it's try to integrate the simulation and uh, uh, synthesis. So with uh, hardware and software, with a bit of AI in it, and then try to, uh, uh, try to find out exactly what it means or what's gonna happen. And then uh, they, the other beauty of you can, the, the, the physical world, okay, will turn into virtual world, and then that can be visualized by the user in the remote site. And then all this information basically and the system, they allow human being, okay, or decision makers to collaborate to diagnosis and jointly make decisions based on what they, the simulation, based on the, uh, the information they got. On the top, okay, and on the top, hopefully the machine will do cell con configuration for resistance and will, will a cell adjust for variations and cell optimize for uh, disturbance. So in other words, the machine will automatically do the configuration and to meet what the uh, user wants or what the, mean the, uh, the system needs. So this is the CPS for the industry 4.0 really, okay? Now we're gonna translate that into uh, this 5C architecture to higher education. So let's start with a, a smart connection layer, okay? Again, we need sensors, okay? The smart con connection layer is in fact, the connection, not only just connection, but also provide the input to the uh, data information conversion. So, you know, like, uh, like uh, uh, the sensor, okay, the sensor itself is not only just installed, it's collected data and then send it to the computer systems so they can process it. So in this case, okay, we have, uh, we have a, a sensor network and quiz, which is uh, an in-class test and exercise, so or the or the student attendance, so we can get the information or the, sorry the data through this layer and then feed it back to the system. So then in the data information conversion layer, then we can say okay the students attendance statics, the course performance, and the cyber layer cyber label here we can predict students progress and progressions, and then connection layer basically is looking to uh, the coordination between the classes and modules and the collaboration between the lecturers and management teams. On the top, with the configuration, configuration label, okay, based on this information, this, the system hopefully will transform the learning environment by itself. And then by providing a, a set of flexible teaching methods, so it depends on the students' needs and then the course objective outcomes and then we can automatically adjust. So the next few slides really, uh, just give you more some, 
I, in fact, I cover most of the points, really. I just give you some more information, really. So, um, for example, okay, uh, the network and sensors, okay, so uh, that is the first thing you need to do to, to, to have uh, a CPS in higher education. Uh, the network here, okay, um, uh, very simple, okay, for example, not the internet what we got only, okay, and the network here, uh, not including the software you use. So, for example, for computer science, okay, or engineering courses, they use a lot of software packages like a MATLAB or like uh, any CAD systems or whatever it is, or simulation tools. Okay, right, so you might, you might find out one thing, okay, you only can use it in the university or particular computer or particular lab. Okay, but here you can use anywhere. The idea is you should be able to use anywhere, anytime, and depends on the, uh, depends on the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the user ID and uh, the IP address. And the sensor here is, the sensor here, okay, and later I will give you an example, okay, how, how the sensor can work in, in, in the class. And the quiz becomes important, okay, and the quiz here, uh, because we want to know what students, you know, how they, how, what sort of progress they made, or how much they have learned from the class. And so, often we do in class test, or some exercise, and, uh, and then within this one, okay, then we probably give them some multiple choice, so they can choose, easy, they can choose different answers, then we easy to mark them. Or well, sometimes it's difficult, okay, because some questions will become like open questions, so they come up with different answers, you know. And, but the keys in here, okay, because um, the keys in here, okay, and these are very important input information, input data for the uh, information system really to process, to find out what sort of uh, 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 understanding label for the students really. And the other one, okay, is student attendance. So the students, okay, now say they have an ID card, uh, student ID card. So if you have, uh, if you have uh, this uh, uh, FID readers in the classroom, and then the, if we, if you link with uh, um, link with uh, a timetable in um, software packages, so in other words, uh, each class room has been allocated uh, by the software systems to certain modules at a certain particular time, and then you also link with uh, also link with uh, the students' uh, registrations. And so when a student come in, you know, with the ID, uh, student card with FID. And then the system should automatically pick it up whether the students attend the class or not. Okay, once we got that information, okay, the students, then the system can start to uh, transform all this uh, uh, data into information, really. The first one, you can see the student attendance, uh, can produce the student attendance statistical information, statistical information. So who is there, who is not, without, you know, without, uh, uh, without the lecturer going there to check system automatically pick it up. And then from this information, you can see you know, how the course of performance, in other words, uh, you have in class test, uh, then you can see uh, the, what's the progress a student made, and the overall, uh, the overall course performance, really students, how they respond to all these uh, uh, teaching methods, and the module performance. And at the same time, you can find the classroom a location and the lab area lab arrangement, so whether this uh, classroom uh, have been allocated efficiently or not, or how many empty rooms during the, during the class, and then we can see the staff workload as well. In the cyber level, okay, uh, we got all this information that depends on uh, individual students, then we can see, we can put all different modules of that particular student together, so to see what sort of, what sort of progress these students made, or is likely to progress to the next so the next label or not, in other words, uh, you know, from first year to second year, are you gonna pass all the modules or not? And then through the attendance, you see, we can see the students, how, how much they engaged with them. And then, then we can predict, you know, if they attend and then do well, likely the student might satisfy with the, with the module, with the course. So we can predict that. If not, then we can do something about it. Then we, at the same time, we can see the lecturer performance and to see, uh, if students feedback nicely, and uh, so the, the lecturer might be able to, uh, you know, continue the work. If not, they might have to adjust a little bit on that. 
And uh, of course, we have a lot of online learning and uh, online learning uh, and modules and uh, and then materials, and might be able to not allow the uh, students to look into it and do the exercise to learn anytime. Then, because the beauty of online learning, okay, the students if they use it, uh, if your student look into all these materials or do the exercise, and the system automatically will record it. So we can uh, cross monitor, monitor the students' uh, performance really, or how, how much they engage. And because all this information, okay, and I don't know uh, you guys, okay, I mean in the UK, okay, uh, there's two time slot uh, most of the lecturers wouldn't like to teach. One is the uh, um, one is a Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. Uh, the other one is a Monday morning. Uh, for the Friday afternoon, okay, uh, the culture is slightly different over there, okay. Uh, a lot of people like to go to the pub on Friday afternoon or evening. So they won't attend the class. They just, you know, they just won't, they, they, they will skip the class. They want to go to the pub. And then they have been drinking, you know, since Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, okay. So on Monday, okay, they couldn't wake up. So likely they're not going to turn up on the mor Monday morning class. So this two time slot, uh, we don't like it at all. I mean, the most lecturer wouldn't like it to teach, really, because of the poor attendance rate. So anyway, so through, through this kind of uh, information, then we can you know, do the scheduling, make sure uh, the class or the module has been uh, timetable appropriately, really. OK, right. Now, we, now after that, we get all information, then we can move to another layup. Uh, Connection. Okay, so we can see the coordinates between classes and modules. So this course is, uh, you know, will I fit into the, fit in, you know, will really uh, work nicely with the uh, all these modules or not? Where this module really uh, support the need of all these uh, uh, courses or classes? Then we can see the collaboration between the lecturers and uh, management teams, how well they, you know, they work together. So, so all this information, the university can define the new strategy. For example, you know, how many students we can recruit if we still got a lot of uh, 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 spare capacity to, 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 to take in. Or maybe we need more uh, lecturers to deliver the courses. Or we need maybe need a new building. So from all this information, and maybe we have to change uh, certain courses, learning outcome, or maybe we have to adjust some learning uh, objective as well for the for the degree or for the modules. So they also give us uh, uh, information really to see whether new modules are needed or not. Whether we do we need the new learning methods or not. Whether the existing methods is it okay or not. Okay, the last bit okay with the configuration. So all that information, okay, then, then we can start to start transform the, info, uh, transform the learning environment. Uh, either through online, 24 hours, uh, with the flexible credit systems, all that kind of stuff. So, and flexible teaching methods, uh, flexible methods, adaptive uh, learning, social media, interactive. So it depends on all these systems system automatically will do the recommendations for that. And the other important thing is uh, personalized student experiences. So through so all this information, then you can start to personalize what students need and then give them appropriate uh, uh, courses or teaching materials. It's not working. Uh, I think the computer get too excited with this slide, so it freeze. Oh gosh, the whole thing freeze now. So basically, what I what I just say, okay, because it's, uh, um, industry 4.0, okay, we have this 5C, and then uh, to support the uh, you know how to automate everything really. So from the connections, network connections, get the data. Central information to process. Yeah, okay. Central information to process. Uh, information to process. Get some statistical information. 
After that, then you can use the simulation tools in the cyber world to find out what would happen if you do A. If, if you do A, what's all the consequence going to be? If, you, if, if, if a consequence A happens, what sort of action we should take? So you can simulate all different things. So give you, you know, for the decision makers, they can, uh, they can based on that to, 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 to assess what's, what next action should take. And then, then the topic is the, the, the cognition. Okay, so basically, because you've done the simulation now, so you know what sort of decision you should make. So start to implement it. Start to introduce new measures, maybe manually or automatically. And uh, the last bit, cell configuration, the system automatically, if we talk about everything is digitalized, digitalized it will automatically do the old adjustment. Last idea, okay. Later we'll talk, about, talk now we're talking about um, the challenge, okay. The idea, the, the one I put down, okay, it's quite, uh, it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite ideal situation, okay. The, the idea what I put up is quite ideal situation, really. But I think that most people, most in university at the moment, um, only, I mean, like a lot of, uh, um, like a lot of companies as well, they, they are still struggling with digitalization. The reason I say that's okay, you mentioned that uh, marking. Most, I think most lecturers at the moment still marking, you know, through your, through your pens and pencils. And then uh, you gotta go through the scripts one by one, but can we do it automatically? For the quiz, multiple choice questions is easy, easier, but for the open questions, answers might be difficult, okay? So we are setting up a new program with uh, a Chinese university, okay? And try, because try to automatically assess the open questions uh, in, the, uh, in the exam. Um, and the reason we can do that now, it's possible now, because the natural language, natural language processing is far more powerful than before now. It's, it's more advanced. It's, so this is, was impossible, but now it become more or less possible now. Okay, I'm just giving you an example like that one, okay? And then even, uh, even, even a lot of university, okay, already installed a number of different uh, supporting softwares, okay? I mean, I'm just, later I'll give you some example like Moodles, and the previous speaker was saying SAP, you know, all this kind of stuff. But the big problem we got now, these are uh, heterogeneous software, they are not really integrated, really. And uh, again, even within the university, okay, and even we have a network, we have, uh, we have, we, you know, we, we, we have a wireless, Wi-Fi, all that kind of stuff, but because a lot of engineering or specialized tools, they require some special communication protocol or interfaces. So they still com cannot communicate really, talk to each other. And then the, lo the, the, the other one is uh, education software tools, okay. And a student normally have the access to different software tools uh, during their degrees. At the moment, okay, most universities don't allow the student to use them in a in certain lab or in a university. So, so can, we, can we allow them to use anywhere? without these kind of restrictions, any time. Okay, of course, we still have a big problem with, it, with a different type of diff different types and all different uh, pieces of hardware systems as well. So they cannot talk to each other really, that's another issue. So now I'm gonna talk about the Coventry, okay. We provide a number of uh, uh, supporting tools, okay. And uh, to give some, uh, we have a Moodle, so probably a lot of universities use Moodle, many is for teaching you know, m management really. So you can find a slide, manage the students. Then have a Sonic. Sonic is more to do with uh, documents. And then for the human resource management, we have a co-crease. Then if you have a lot of papers, you know, or we have to uh, uh, manage all these uh, uh, publications, then we have a pure. And uh, if you have any IT problems, we have a this uh, log me in system. So, so you know, allow you to to uh, report your problems, and then the system, the any any problems will be recorded, will be solved, and tra traceable through this uh, uh, stuff. And then we have a uh, this uh, ethic uh, management system. So in the UK, okay, and all the project gotta be evaluated, really see to see whether it's uh, ethical or not. Uh, any work you're doing. So we need to go through this ethical uh, uh, management system. And for the classroom, we have a, a timetable in, we have a timetable system to, to you know, allow you to book the classroom for the, for the whole year or for a particular time for a meeting. 
Okay, right. So even we have so many softwares. Okay, even we use different. You know, we have. Uh, yeah, we have so many different software, so deal with different things. But uh, we still have problem with the communication or integration between all these softwares. Okay, right. And simple example. Okay, like print, printer. Okay, and I don't know here. Okay, and um, if a student have one document okay, or some course work and need to print assignment, need to print. So they only can collect that, collect this uh, the hard copies from certain printer, or they can only print out from certain printers. But can they print out anywhere they like in the campus or outside campus? And here again, okay, can you uh, home PC access to the university software? Since the university already bought the software, you know, from the uh, um, since from the uh, vendors, so you know they should look into the user ID rather than the PC IP or or the IP address. Okay, right. So th this this is a. Uh, uh, this is, you know, simple issue like this. Okay, attendance management. Okay, the student got. I mentioned earlier. Okay, the student got. Nobody got your student card, and the student card. Okay, uh, nobody. Uh, what we got is the RFID, and each classroom have an RFID reader. So, so the student before they attend the class, okay, uh, or they just go into the class, they have to swipe or just touch the uh, the reader. So the system automatically pick it up where the students attend the class or not, or is in the class or not. If a student didn't attend the class for the two, uh, two exact times, you know, uh, for example, like this week and next week, the system automatically will pick up and then will alert the module leader, will send an email to students. Okay, even we got all this, diff then we have a, this a course, Sonic, a course management system, okay. This course management system basically have uh, uh, a list of uh, 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 modules, okay, and for the courses in, the student must attend. So from this system, so we can see the the overall student attendance rate for the module for the courses. And the Moodle, okay, basically uh, for the lecture notes, for the quiz, for the in-class test, everything we can implement here. I think the Cornell University use one. There's another very popular system called Blackboard. And then the, the Moodle system, okay, the good thing about it, I mean, you know, uh, plagiarism always is a big case, especially when you're writing an essay. It's a big, big problem for the uh, 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 university, really. So, so in, the Moodle here, in, in the Moodle here, okay, uh, we can use a tool called Turning In to automatically detect where the students' uh, coursework or assignments has have been uh, any suspicion of plagiarism. Okay, right. So even we, I'm just giving example. Okay, even we have two simple systems. Okay, and uh, the Moodle. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, they have a quiz, and then when you do the, the lecture, do the marking, they can put the marks in it. And uh, that's another thing. Okay, in the UK. Okay, which is slightly different from here, uh, from uh, probably uh, more in the European countries, really, or um, probably in the United States. We cannot, we cannot announce other stu uh, students' uh, marks or the result in front of class. So basically, we only can inform the students for their mark. We cannot inform other people's mark to other, I'm sorry, we cannot inform the student mark to other students. Okay, right, so it become a problem now. And so the only way we can do it really is through this, uh, uh, the Moodle, okay. So basically, where system automatically will announce that, will, will be able to, uh, to see that really. Okay, right. So we have a Sonic system, okay, and which is in charge of this uh, attendance. But there's no link between the Moodle and the Sonic system. So we cannot really find a correlation between, uh, between you know, if a student doing badly, so what would happen, and what happened is because of poor attendance or not. We have to, we have to do manually to pull two information systems together in order to do that. Okay, right. So basically. Uh, uh, I'll just give you some overview, okay? So we done quite a bit on this digitalization. But as well as I said earlier, there's a problem is uh, integration. And uh, a lot of digitalization haven't done yet. As well as I said earlier, I said, like a marking, all kind of things. Okay, right, the, other, the, the last one, okay, I'm gonna talk quickly go through, okay? I'm, 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 I'm aware I'm wrong all the time, okay? It's a cloud service for e-learning, so I'm gonna skip quite a bit of slide. So basically, um, this is a EU, EU funded project, okay, involved uh, six countries, uh, seven institutes within the EU. And uh, so ideally, okay, uh, it's uh, what we try to do here, and because um, and the, um, 
like a CNC machine, okay, robot arms, robots, they are very expensive, okay, and they are very specialized. And then uh, nobody, each university can only have a very limited number of all this uh, equipment. And then no, a class in the UK normally uh, roughly have about 20 to 30. So unlikely we have a 20 or 30 machines can be used at, at the same time. So it, within this project, okay, what we try to do here, try to pull all the European, uh, you know, some institute together. So if you have a, you know, you have a three CNC machine, I have a two, so can we pull it together as a virtual pool? So this sort of student can use, can use this machine together. So last idea. And so, so basically this uh, here, what we try to do here, is try to set up some remote app in different countries. And then the, the learner, okay, can access such equipment and then, uh, and and the equipment and then support there some practical learning, especially in mechatronic this area. Okay, mechatronic basically it's a, it's a, uh, it's a multiple disciplines so combining, uh, combining electronic, computer science, and uh, electronics. So, so, and so not only just, uh, uh, not only just uh, local equipment to do it, but sometimes uh, uh, the instructor or lecturers also uh, also have some problem with the uh, resources and time management as well. So basically, uh, so basically, we try to make all this uh, idle or non-used, uh, all these CNC machine available and in the pool, so they can be shared among the uh, users, among the uh, different institutes. Okay, right. So basically, and uh, I'm not going to talk about this one. E-learning. And there's three type of remote lab, okay, and how they will do it, okay, you can use the batch, so basically whole experiment are defined in advance, and instruction set, and so the experiment can be run without any user interactions. And the other one is more interactive one, really, the user can be involved, be able to uh, change some parameters. And the last one is monitoring, so basically uh, they use the sensor to, to, uh, to collect the data, and then, uh, and then, uh, the user only simplify, simply can moni uh, monitor the, uh, uh, the status of the machines rather than you can control anything really or carry out any interaction with them. Okay, right, the virtual lab, okay. So basically there are three types of virtual lab, recreation one and simulation one really. And the different institutes have worked different way on, you know, to support different things, you know, to uh, support this e-learning. And the remote lab, okay. And what the claim can do, okay, what we can, we, in, what we try to do here, we try to have a real device connected to the software control so the, uh, so the student can really, con can use the software to control the real device like uh, CNC or robot arms. And, uh, and then we hope there's some community which is in the same area can contribute to their knowledge. So we set up uh, expert channels, a com community channel so they can, like uh, Facebook, they can share some experiences. If you have any questions, then you can ask this expert through this uh, uh, social medians, and hopefully the experts can answer the questions. So we try to adopt the, you know, we try to uh, uh, try to resolve this problem by adopting the uh, cloud technology. Really, and uh, I'm not going to repeat this log here. Okay, you can see this is some properties here, and so basically, uh, it, the, the system we design is on demand, is self services, so. Uh, basically, we can deliver e-learning e resource to the teacher and then uh, learn based on their demands because we can connect to different number of machines and type of machines and it depends on what you need, really. And then it's a broad, broad network access because we uh, make the variables over the internet so you can access it anytime, anywhere, by and any device as well. Uh, it's a resource pooling, okay, so we pull in different, uh, we pull in different, not only just machines, but also uh, learners and trainers together as well. So they can exchange uh, the hardware resources, but also exchange their knowledge and experiences. And then because the whole system, okay, it's, uh, it's based on uh, this cloud concept, so it's a uh, rapid elastic, elasticity, okay, so uh, the machine can be increased by Right, uh, we need to register a few more machines. Uh, when you do, when, uh, sorry, you can include more machines when you do registrations. And then, 
the major service, okay, and the cloud mentioned, okay, because it got to pay for it. Well, in our case, we, it's free services because it's funded by the EU, so we cannot charge. Okay, right, so I'm just give you, I'm not going into detail about this uh, overall case. Okay, so basically three different, uh, three, three layers here, infrastructure, platforms, and applications. So basically this diagram here show you the, uh, the, the components or supporting components of what we have uh, in the system, and then that compare with the service model in the uh, uh, cloud. Uh, I'm going to skip this bit here because this uh, it's a uh, literal it basically try to say local our system is quite you know unique because uh, this is not you know and have been done before and we compare with other uh, existing architecture or methods okay right so basically this is give it overview okay and what it will look like so basically we have a trainer and a learner here so this is an user could be anywhere in the world and then they can have this server here okay and then they have a remote PC connect to or this microcontroller, microcontroller control linked with uh, the actual CNC machines or robot arms or robots. So here I also have a rapid course builder. Okay, so basically it's like a Moodle. You can easy to pull all these slides and, and courses or programs together. And then we have a community expert volume, so you can yeah ask questions. So and uh, here we basically is to show you the you know just give it over a picture really. And this is uh, the this is the web page, and this is some simple slides about this uh, you know about the engine works, and this is a, a timetable that you can book the time how many machines you want, and this is actual you can control it and in this case it's through the motor, and this is on the side so you can control the CNC machines and some electronic components or equipment. Okay, right, so um, the next few slides really, I'm um, just quickly go through, okay, because it just gives you some ideas about, you know, we, done, we, 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 we sent our questionnaire over 1,000 stu students or participants and find out what's, what, do, what do they think about the system. So this is just some of the questions we ask. And we ask also how, you, how helpful is the tool, the claim project, and how easy we can use. And, uh, and how, how, how this activity can help to can generate the interest for the students. And uh, we are talking about the style. Okay, right, so basically this is uh, a LaClaim project really, so basically uh, it's an uh, it's, uh, appropriate problem really, and uh, so this is the tailor for gathering this uh, heterogeneous distributed mechatronic device in a common pool for the uh, learner to use. Okay, right, so the conclusion here, okay, um, I think the share, com and the industry 4.0 and uh, education 4.0 share common characteristic, okay, automation and quick feedback and reactions, big data analytics support decision making, and uh, you know, to have an agile environment and goal-oriented management, really. But the first thing we need to do, really, is to digitalize. We haven't done the digitalization, similar to industry 4.0, really. And then after that, then we need to do integration before you can go further up really. Even with the bits piece in, you know, in the uh, uh, information, information layer, this, um, cyber layer, cyber, cyber layer, and uh, connection layer, or computation layer, but not really uh, talking about full automation still far away really. And of course, we need to explore more on AI and machine learning, uh, you know, to, to, to automate and everything really, and to, uh, to give a real and useful feedback. Okay, sorry, I've been a bit wrong over the time, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Chang. Um, actually, we a bit behind of schedule, so may I suggest that we would have one comment or one maybe question from the floor. Just the we, and then we will proceed with the second speaker for my session. Um, could you please, we, all, we would like to invite one question from the floor. Uh, you have any question, please? Um. So uh, I think maybe after a while we will have question for you. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, you. Professor Chow, yeah, thank you for your very interesting insightful and especially very detailed uh, explanation on how can we apply cyber physical system in higher education. Thank you, Professor Jia. Yeah.
Next, I would like to call upon uh, Professor Dosam Huang. Uh, uh, briefly, okay, I will be short, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, Professor Huang come from uh, Yunnan, you stay from uh, uh, South Korea. He uh, is a full professor uh, for the Department of Computer Engineering at Yunnan University. Um, his scientific interests uh, include uh, nat natural language processing, ontology, uh, knowledge engineering, information retrieval, and machine translation. Uh, Professor Huang uh, served as the head of Yunnan University Computer Engineering Department for five years from 2005 and 2009. He has also held a uh, position and has invited Professor uh, for uh, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and Principal Researcher for uh, Korea Institute of Science and Technology. Professor, it's so, enough. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. You have meant to read. Okay. Anyway, he uh, also um, has, been, uh, has been chairing several, uh, several international conferences. Uh, serving as a uh, member of a number of Korean, um, Korean uh, uh, high-profile uh, project uh, and so on. In recognition of his great uh, commitment and contribution to the field of study, Professor Wang has been honored as a distinguished researcher for Korean Institute of the Science and Technology by Korea Ministry of Science and Technology and awarded a prize for good conduct from Kung Hee High School in 1973. And thank you. I would like to invite you just to de deliver your presentation on uh, education 4.0, future education for the fourth industrial revolution. Please, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Wang. Thank you, Pro uh, Session Chair, Professor Nguyen, uh, for the uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dosaman uh, from uh, Korea. Uh, to begin, uh, I'd like to express my uh, deep, sincere uh, gratitude. Thank you. Uh, to profess nuance, there are so many profess nuance. It's so convenient. <laughs> Especially, I would like to give uh, my deep thanks, Professor Noctang Nguyen, and entity persons for uh, inviting me to this wonderful conference. Uh, my topic is education, I ability uh, the future. Education, uh, education for, for uh, the fourth industrial uh, revolution. As you know, the fourth industrial revolution is coming to us. Or maybe we have already lived in the age of fourth industrial revolution. Of, of course, there are counter arguments to this claim. Yeah, for example, some experts even the definition of the fourth industrial revolution has not been established. But uh, the fourth industrial revolution is long, so I, I will call this uh, only 4IR from now on. It's a hard issue in Korea too. Okay? So we encounter this world for IL every day, maybe more than five times. So the revolution will open a software oriented center, intelligence and information society. According to the future of jobs published by World Economic Forum called simply Davos Forum, uh, pu published by uh, 7 million jobs will disappear, while 
about two million jobs will be created uh, by 2020, believe it or not, already published by the qualified authorities. And the famous futurologist Thomas Frey predicts 70, uh, 47, I'm sorry, 47% of jobs will be lost due to AI or robots. It may not be a revolution, but it is obvious the new changes have already occurred and coming to us in the industries in the world. I will show the three examples. As you know, most experts thought machine could never defeat human at Go game, an ancient board game. But last year, AlphaGo defeated Sadly, Korean player, one of the uh, world-class players, last year, March 2016. And in this year, AlphaGo defeated Koze, the Chinese, one of the rank, uh, the top-ranked player, in May, in 2017. The second example is, in 2017, US IT companies uh, occupied the top, top five companies of grand, global companies in the world based on the brand value. What you can see is, the five, all the top, top five company is IT company, okay? Google, Apple, Amazon, AT&T, as you know, Microsoft. The last example is Korea company invested $20 billion. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, invested $20 billion to the semiconductor fields last year. But only 900 workers have been employed annually. For example, you know, a Samsung Electronic Company invested, invested $13 billion last year. But Oh, additionally, only 650 workers were hired last year. What do you have to do when the new age, the source of new age is approaching us? It is clear, as you know, industries are important for human and country development. New technology can create new industries, and new industries transform country and can make new country. This new technology can be developed by new education. Then, what are the main technologies for the age of for IR? As you know, this includes robots and drone, big data and AI, ARVR, self-driving cars, IoT, 3D printers, NLP. I'm sorry, missed the <laughs> professor here. Uh, uh, nanotechnology also <laughs> can be included. So you can see here is software is core technology for all these technologies. 
So software education, so co called simply coding, is already being taught uh, beginning in the low levels of screen uh, in uh, several developed countries, US and Great, Great Britain, and so on. In Korea, software course has been chosen as an elementary, uh, essential subjects in elementary school, junior and high school, starting in 2018. So, I suggest you uh, software education from an early age as part of education for the future, for IR. Of course, there are pros and cons to teaching software from an early age, but it is very essential and beneficial to the age of 4IR. New education methodology and systems and tools I have already in introduced and are operating by several developed countries and universities. Professor Bosen I have already introduced with very good examples, book adaptive learning and blended learning, pre classroom, classroom with SNS and digital devices. I, I will skip this and I do not focus on this subject uh, today, so I skip. My university has e-learning center where professors and students make their lecture materials and contents with these systems. So they can operate the mater materials uh, developed by the uh, e-learning uh, systems as I have introduced. So Professor Nguyen thankfully visit my e-learning center. Uh, and uh, this is the picture from the visit, where, uh, as you know, Professor Nguyen is very sincere and very diligent and active, Ca came to my university and see uh, the system with me. So I respect Professor Nguyen. Uh, it takes about only 10 minutes for young students to learn how to make the lecture materials. Of course, it takes about, about 30 minutes for me and Prof. <laughs> Professor Nguyen too, okay? So I agree with Professor Bosen's uh, early recommendation, okay? To hire younger instructors. <laughs> I agree, completely agree with you. As a encourage policy uh, during the in, uh, introduction steps of internet lectures, uh, ad additional salaries they have uh, given to the pro professors conducting the internal lectures and a special scores, assess assessment scores have given to the professor's achievement. I do not, but I did not join the, the <laughs> policy, uh, the uh, internal lectures. The, anyway, education administration should be also operated systematically. So, uh, all of, almost all of administration of my university is operated by a URP system, Universe Resource Planning, of, Planning System. It is one of the screenshots of URP. So, uh, there are many kinds of administrations operated. For example, uh, I, uh, undergraduate and graduate general administration and R&D and operated organizations. As so many, for example, uh, of undergraduate, uh, there are regist, class, grade, scholarship, graduation students, and the employment, and so on. Okay, there are so many. Uh, functions each uh, administration and management, so I skip, I only uh, explain the robot, okay? 
The attendance of students were checked automatically by sensors equipped to uh, every classroom. And the logbook linked to the grade system, so calculated scores automatically. And more well, you, uh, you can, and uh, as well as students can use by the PC, computers, or smartphone applications. This is a, a, support, a lecture supporting system of my university. Uh, there are uh, notice and Q&A bulletins, and professors can upload their lecture materials, and students can download lecture materials, of course, and can upload, students can upload their reports, and uh, there are uh, lecture introduction and schedule, of course, and professors can uh, search the students' information, okay? And can communicate it with students by message system, email and uh, smartphone message was linked to this. But uh, although educational methodology and system tools are so good, if you do not use them in your circumstances appropriately, they become useless, okay, as you know. So education must adapt as necessary. So I show you, I think Vietnam is very similar to Korea, so I surveyed, okay? Especially in terms of, oh, sorry, in terms of education and economic growth, not, <laughs> it is my, not, not So, this graph shows the number of universities and students according to economic growth in Korea. Okay? Uh, this blue line is Korean GDP. Okay? Uh, in 2015, Korean GDP was $27,000. Okay? Uh, it is more than 11 times the number in 1985. And this yellow line is for number of universities. Then number reached it to 433. Okay? It's uh, about twice, twice than uh, 1985. Okay? And the last the number of students is the green line. Is, uh, there were 3.6 million students in 2015. Okay? It's about uh, three times the number in 1985. Next graph is a Vietnamese graph. I surveyed. Same. Uh, okay. This is blue line GDP. It, in 2015, uh, GDP is 20, about $21,000. It is almost seven times greater today than Nine, 1995, okay? And the number of universe, uh, that number reached it to uh, 445, okay? It's about uh, seven times. And the number of students uh, is, there were 2.1 million students in 2015, okay? It's about four times the number in 1995, okay? So, uh, this graph shows the two countries overlap. Okay? The upper blue line represents Korea, and the bottom line shows uh, the Vietnamese graph. Okay? So what you, can, you have to see is uh, overall the pattern of the graphs are so similar. Of course, uh, the number of the university has increased rapidly since uh, 2004 in Vietnamese case. It's very similar. So uh, before uh, saying, telling what we have to educate, I'd like to uh, tell about what is education. That is the definition of education. 
I'm very happy. I uh, got the, you also got the, the very good present, book and badge. Uh, there were very, very many good uh, words from uh, for about uh, education uh, by the very famous people, Steve Jobs and uh, Benjamin Franklin and uh, Mandela Nelson, and so on. It's very good. Okay. Of course, many scholars have defined the education uh, from various aspects, especially in West. But I'd like to introduce one definition uh, defined by Korean scholar. I like it. He defined the education. is a way to improve human life and make it affluent. It has its real meaning in raising humans righteously and in providing the elements that constitute our personalities. I like it. I think that is the definition of a truthful education. As you know, there are three elements to education. Students and teachers and books can be uh, included for students also. Uh, based on these three factors, I represent education by uh, functions. I have already introduced this mathematical model of education at an international International a Conference, ACII Day 2015, a general fair, uh, chair was Professor Nguyen. So uh, I only explained the conceptual, not theoretical in depth. Okay? Uh, I represented two functions. One is, one is every quantity progress, and the other function is qualitative progress in education. And the entire education uh, represented by uh, the multiplying the two functions, quantitative and qualitative functions. The basic quantitative measure of education progress, if we, the first uh, function, is represented by three factors. So the, the, teacher and text. And each factor is represented by uh, exponential function. So uh, there are limitations to quantitative factors of educational progress. So as an example of improvement of the quantitative, quantitative uh, measure of education, EV, uh, I will show the case of Korea. Uh, this graph shows that Korea has uh, invested the budget, increased the budget of education and R&D budget. Uh, since 2007, okay? uh, in 2007, the budget, education and the R&D budget uh, combined were uh, about $41 billion. It's uh, about 17% uh, the total budget for Korea and the increase to uh, $77 billion. It is about 19% of total budget of Korea. As, as the uh, growing economic growth, uh, Korean government and companies have supported universities in various ways. I'd like to tell you three types of support. One is, the first is Korean government uh, supported universities, large scale projects to cultivate students, such as 
BK means brain Korea, and link CK creative Korea, prime, very good name. WCU is a world class university, and software oriented university. The second is Korean company have supported universities by opening customized education departments. It's each to their shooted to each company. Korean major university, such as, uh, no, companies, as, as you know, uh, Samsung, LG, SK, and the NHN, called simply known to neighbor, uh, have, have joined in these projects with the agreement of universities. So these projects help students to adapt early just after graduation. They, they, so they can use their knowledge and contents studied in courses, which is suited to each company's specialty. The last is contracted departments. A representative of them are semiconductor department open in Songgyunggwan University, as there are uh, software specialized department and big data and cyber national defense department. So students can be employed just after by the uh, graduation by the contracted uh, departments. These are uh, national projects supported by the go Korean government, but I, I think we don't have much time, so I'd like to skip this. As an example of the results by increased the EV, the quantitative measure of education, I show you the rank of Korean university. This graph shows the rank of the Korean three representative university, for example, SNU, Seoul National University, and KAIST, and post -tech. Okay, so uh, since 2004, okay. uh, the three universities tend to place all uh, top 50 in the world. Okay. But let's look at the graph in detail. The three universities uh, have been at the top 50 before 2014, okay? But they could not break the, the strong wall, the top 20 in the world, okay? 20, only 26, uh, 24 is best, okay? And more, after 2014, all of the three universities have fallen, okay, below, below top 50. Okay, so I think you can see there are the limitations in the progress of the quantitative education. The second factor is qualitative measure of education progress, EM. Uh, it is composed of, oh sorry, three factors. One is relationship and the spirit and time. Okay? So uh, conceptually uh, speaking, my MS medical model of education are represented by two, two functions as I have already uh, introduced. The first is quantitative measurement, EV. Okay? And uh, it is represented by the volume of the figure, okay, I thought, I defined. And second function is represented by color, uh, the mass, uh, density of figure, okay? And the, the education uh, measured by the mass of the figure, okay? So, I sh show you already, there are limitations in improving 
quantitative education. So we have to focus on improve the qualitative education, I think, I suggest. That is spread. Okay. Uh, before uh, telling about the uh, spread factors, I think you are uh, already sleepy because it's time after lunch. Eh? So uh, I'd like to show you a movie, Interstellar, played in 2014. Did you see the movie? Okay. So uh, let's watch this movie. And uh, I'd like to tell you the basic plot of the movie. The story is a father left uh, Earth to go traveling in, out in space to save humankind and Earth. Why traveling in space? He fell into a black hole and was caught up in a completely different space and time. This scene is, even though he is in a different space time, he, the father, he, trying to send the message to his daughter on Earth. Do you think this message can be sent to her on Earth in different dimensions? Common, common sense tells us it cannot, it is impossible, okay? To save the world. Please remember this scene, okay? All of we will watch one little girl's later again. Every moment, it's infinitely complex. They have access. Okay, let's continue to introduce spirit factors, okay? to improve spiritual education, qualitative education. I will introduce several factors from now on. The first is challenge. Without challenge, we cannot proceed to subsequent next steps. Okay? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little surprised while I surveyed the data. There are so many outstanding scholars, Vietnamese scholars in the world, okay? And I'm very proud of, uh, there are some, uh, some uh, professors, my friend, okay? I showed some professors uh, are now working throughout the world. They uh, feel so happy, both the UN and any other, for all professors may be very happy. But think, I think they went abroad and had overcome many difficulties and hardships. At last, they got a success, okay? So I believe one of the common features of their success is challenge, okay? Without challenge, we cannot proceed next steps. I recommend you, you report the Akita International University in Japan has operated the global exchange program. As the reason, the employment of rate of the university AIU graduates has been at the top for seven straight years in Japan. Wonderful, great. And 100% of all graduating students have secured employments for four years of stay. And I'm very surprised. I read the books, NTTU pamphlets. The employment rate was 95%. It's, it's so great. Okay? Uh, and the AIU has been chosen as the top one university in Japan. Okay? Usually we think to Tokyo University is first, but 
Tokyo University is ranked second. So I recommend before you report this university. So I suggest strongly to give students to go to study abroad for one year. If not, at least one semester before graduation. Are there here students? Do you agree? <laughs> you like <laughs> no students? Oh, you professors. You don't need to go to a problem. <laughs> OK? Next is cooperation. Can be crude, sacrifice, and contribution. Uh, Korea has ranked top class in the PISA assessment, you know PISA, Program for International Student Assessment, top class. This is a best medic rank. The blue line is Korea, it's top rank. And the other is developed country, you know, US, Germany, United Kingdom, France, and the red line is Israel. And this is science rank, and this is reading rank. Korea has top ranked all the part, okay? But however, however, very, very shamefully, unfortunately, there are no Korean who have won Nobel Prize at academic fields until now. But as you know, Jewish winners of the Nobel Prize accounts for 22% until 2015, and almost 40% in economic fields. So we think, okay, generally, Jewish students are so excellent, but it is not necessarily true. Not work. Ah. In Israel, education emphasizes cooperation more than academic study. In a more complex society, we cannot improve only oneself. We have to cooperate each other with others. I recommend you second university, Handong University in Korea. As an operative gem, global engagement and mobilization, students must go abroad and contribute and sacrifice themselves for above one year okay, before graduating. This university is very small, a new university, somewhat university, but very promising rising university in Korea. Even though the Chris rank is not so high, but very, very good university, I think, I believe. Next, split factor is environment. Okay? In the age of the 4IL, society demands students who have abilities, such kind of creativity and critical thinking and problem solving abilities. So Nature-friendly environments, as well as nature, make humans affluent and increase students' abilities. More than new advances with ICT devices. So I recommend making your campus nature-friendly. Can give creativity. This is the library of Akita International University in Japan. Okay? So gorgeous, beautiful. Only by sitting there, I think, the knowledge can enter my brain automatically. Okay? I can study all day long there. I hope, I hope 
stay there all day. And if only one student studied, stayed in the library of Akita University, the library do not close. Only four, only one student open for 24 hours. It's great. Books make people come together. Okay? They make increase the spiritual power of students. Okay? For C, as you know, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, the abilities, demanded, required for, for the future. So, therefore, English and writing and art and music, especially, I think, traditional music is very important. And sports, athletics, fusion education are very essential for the future. And philosophy, history, of course. And lifelong education and re-education also required for the aging society and coming the society of the uh, rapid changing technology society. The last spiritual factor is uh, love and trust and faith. I'll show you the movie again. Okay? Do not sleep. <laughs> Let's watch again. The message okay, the father sent was able to traverse the different space and time through the different dimensions. That is, the father behind the bookshelf could signal his daughter, letting her know he is still alive. But this cannot be explained by physical and quantitative factors of my educational model. If another girl saw the message, the hands of clock moving, she might pass by thinking only that the clock has broken down without recognizing the true meaning. But the clock provided very, very important meaning for both his fa her father and his daughter, Murphy. Murphy believed her father was still alive and would surely keep the promise to return to her in place. In that situation, when she saw the hands of a clown movie, the daughter, she recognized her father is still alive and trying to send, tell he is still alive. That can be possible because there are long and faithful relationship for between father and his daughter in love and trust. That is, it can be understandable by adding the spiritual factors of my education model. Today is the present remarkable development of Korea. We are Korea was so, so, so poor, poor than Africa, every nation. But now, wonderful, became wonderful. Korea is 11th economic power, great power, nation. But it is made possible, made by missionaries. They came to Korea. At that time, Korea was unknown in the barren lands. They came without failing a death. And sometimes their friends and family and children was died, 
just after coming to Korea. They constructed schools and plenty the root of education in Korea. This is the first modern university, Yonsei University. Now it's top five in Korea. It was founded by two missionaries, Allen and Underwood. In such a bad environment, they constructed about 800 schools since 1885. And they taught Korean people with love. This is your women's university. It's top class in, in the world in women's university. Very wonderful campus. However, Korean have forgotten their contributions and sacrifice and love and only compete rival each other to gain their goals and purpose, their own goals and purpose. This is the reason, I believe, I think, for the stagnation and decline of Korea, present Korea. We do not, we Koreans do not promote or teach love and trust any longer at school as well as at home. I suggest Vietnam is similar to Korea. Do you think Vietnam is similar to Korea? No. I think Vietnam is better than Korea in many ways. I show you. The first, Vietnam is three times greater than Korea in a land area. In Vietnamese population is two times greater than Korea population. Vietnam has many resources we don't have. Furthermore, Korea is divided to north and south, as you know. But Vietnam is united one nation. I very envy you. Vietnam has a long, deep history. Okay? And Vietnam means concede the education the most. As you know, late president of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, considers education is the most. I do like introduce the saying I Confucius. This is Korean. He said, plant crops for one year's prosperity and plant trees for ten years' prosperity. What is next? Please tell me. I think you know. Plant humans educate children for 100 years means not only 100, 10,000, okay, forever. Years prosperity, forever. I'd like to wrap up my representation. Vietnam should educate for becoming a better nation. Educate. Vietnam can improve more than Korea in the near future through the education. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe it. Thank you. That's all.
Thank you, Professor Wang, especially for your recommendation and wishes, good wishes for Vietnam and for Vietnamese education. So um, I think we uh, should. Uh, So, uh, Prof. Stanwood, uh, he suggesting that we will uh, maybe have uh, one question for Prof. Prof. Wang before we break for coffee. Because we behind schedule now is uh, more than uh, three, uh, only three twenty-five minutes. So, may, 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 may I invite one question or comment from the floor, from the participant, please. Uh, <coughs> Um, uh, <laughs> that, that, yeah, Professor Tan, please. Only one comment. I would like to <coughs> the, the lesson. The, you you, um, you gave us a, a lesson about the education, and I think that it uh, it contains very deep thinking about education, and it it is for me a very interesting and and a very. Uh, uh, to, useful lesson because I think that uh, people uh, dealing with education in Vietnam should think about the philosophy of education first and uh, the lecture of Professor Huang is really very very useful for us yes. thank you very much thank you thank you thank you for your comments so um, should we break for for coffee right now and uh, could you come back uh, Yes, you may ask uh, Mr. Kim to, to, to make some announcement, please. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. For your Thank you very much. Before we inject uh, a dose of coffee, let me show you something. We have posted on the presentation slide of all the professors who have presented today on the website of the conference. If you go to the link of the conference website, you will see on the presentation today. You can download it and use for your own self use. Thank you very much. Outside the hall is the, some snack and drink. You can have some if you like. Thank you. If you go to the website university form o dot entity dot edu dot vn slash agenda dot php, you're gonna see the Asian agenda and all the presentation of the professor of today.
uh, innovation oriented basic research so we have to define what direction is important for my university so we consider the uh, tendency of the world about the universe the, uh, about the priority of the Viet Vietnam and the strength of the Vietnam National University so by com combining these three points so we have already uh, de defined the seven priority of the research in my university that is advanced material for the green growth and bioenergy so about the uh, food safety about the climate change and about the simulation about the minor uh, structure and smart integrated si si system and uh, uh, I keep this part So in particular, nowadays, we start to setting up some of the center for the support, the startup for the student and the young faculty member. So here, uh, this is the Minister of uh, Science and Technology of Vietnam. He come to Mr. O, o, opening this center for the, uh, the startup in my university. And we try to bring up very big building for this. So it is that we, we are in the starting point, but we already pay attention to the innovation activity in my university. Yeah. So uh, I uh, get back for this smart university, it also. Yeah. Final uh, slide. So I will like that. I, uh, I and also Professor uh, um, President of the University of Winton Thanh, we also already have a talk with the uh, Minister of Higher Education of Vietnam. And uh, we talked with him about uh, how to run in the University 4.0 uh, in, in Viet Vietnam. So the pr minister told us that, okay, theoretical is very complicated. Yeah? CPS also very complicated. So they asked me, so try to list own the category, character, indicator, what about the university 4.0? And then we try to make one software, yeah, one website, in order all the university can come there and doing their benchmark. For example, I will make the link for the category of the university of 200 of Q, 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 of QS. And you enter your parameter, and you can see that, oh, this parameter, you are only 200 of uh, top uh, of Q, Q, QS. And for the, the other parameter is low, so you have to do the investment for that uh, parameter. Yeah? So by this way, I would like to end my talk here. So I would like to say that my approach is we try to understand about the nature of the university of 4.0, and then we try to make application the 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 software, the website, in order that whole the University of Vietnam can be applied and do benchmark for the university. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. The idea of innovation-driven smart university is very interesting. I think uh, in, in this region, we have sort of a, a bit of conflict between original research yeah. and applications. Yeah, right. Our governments always require applications that could yeah, contribute yeah, to contribute to the country. Yeah. When researchers would like to publish original research, yeah. Yeah. so we have to balance this. And this innovation-driven approach is perhaps a good answer. Uh, we, we still have time for questions. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you for your, uh, for your nice presentation. Um, can you say a few words about how difficult it is to start a company in Vietnam? So suppose one of your students has a brilliant idea, comes out of an entrepreneurial university and now wants to start its own business. How difficult is that? 
we have more difficult than that because first for the industry of Vietnam eh, very few factory of Vietnam the industry of Vietnam try to contact the and act put the question for the university how to do the research and the uh, technology transfer so as why well, very difficult to develop the research in the university that's the first first one the second one is uh, the achievement of the research and technology in the universe uh, university of vietnam is very very low yeah because many people uh, hurry to do the application so as why they do not pay attention to do the very very high quality research they can uh, searching in the website something like that uh, to do the application so the application is ve very very weak so the impact to the social uh, society is ve very very weak and 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 then if we do nothing the attitude of university is seen very very high but okay i i i understand and if we do some application a very well very very low le, le, very low le, level so the attitude of university is down and now your question is about the startup of the student and so on yeah uh, i say that when nowadays we start to organize some com competition for the innovation idea of the student and we make a selection what is good so some company will do the investment or the other one so i from uh, myself from vice president so i can find also some funding to do the investment for the innovation idea of my student this is this story yeah the, the story of uh, this one yeah. yeah okay thank you and any more questions please Yes, uh, thank you. I'm Guan from Malaysia. Uh, as, uh, your, thank you for your presentation, which is very informative about Vietnam moving towards uh, Education 4.0. As I can see, the university, VNU, Vietnam National University, is moving towards becoming an entrepreneurial university for Vietnam. Uh, do you foresee that uh, funding from the government will be decreasing because as you as you go forward towards become an entrepreneurial university, I would, uh, I would think that your university will be generating more and more income for yourself. And subsequently, uh, you will be depending less on the government uh, funding. Am I, am I right on, uh, on commenting on this? That's my question. Yeah. Uh, are you, uh, uh, is the government is, uh, planning to reduce your funding? Because as you are becoming a business university, you, you probably can generate more money for yourself. Uh, in, in, in this case, we would like to say that uh, at the moment, uh, uh, Viet, Vietnam are not in the, the situation that you have mentioned. Because nowadays, the government try to increase the funding for the research and education. But the problem from my university is how we can create a good research program research design is very very important but you are can design one uh, uh, the topic is very 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 low level and so on we cannot pass the examination and you we cannot get the money from the government so the biggest problem for the vietnam is now is that so as why in my case i have setting up uh, some key lab key laboratory with the modern of the co-director. Uh, one director is like Vietnamese, and the other one, I invite one very famous professor from Korea, from Japan, something like that, and uh, the international uh, director. They do not pay attention for the administration and so on, but they can only function in the creating, design, the research program, and so on. So by this way, we can have very good uh, uh, research program and then we can apply for the government and then we can gain money from the government so by that 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 that's the way yeah
Oh, yes, please. Professor Duke, I would like to ask one question. You saw in the, in the table that uh, Nyang, Nyang University has 5,000 researchers, okay? The Singapore uni University. Yes, here, here, here. Okay. Uh, the next one, the next one. The, ne the, next, uh, the next slide. Okay, okay, but the, 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 nec the, the next slide, please. The next slide. Yes, here. Is it publication? Uh, ah, it's number of publication. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1995, there was only this. We are here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where, where Yes. <laughs> but uh, comparing with the, with the Singapore, we have we have a very small, <laughs> very small. My question is: What is the strategy of Vietnamese the government to to enlarge the number? Uh, Vietnam national you uh, no uh, Vietnam have already established. The how say the na state, which means that uh, funding for the basic research, and they only the counting if you make application for the two ISI publication, so you can get this money. But you make the application for the three or five publication, so they will get higher money and so on. So by this way, the number of the ISI publication of Vietnam now increasing very very fast. Yeah, but we have the other problem quality of the international publication. Uh, very high number, but very low uh, number of citation. So that's why uh, we are going to organize some, uh, uh, some, meet, some meeting, try to solve this problem. So at the beginning, number, and now we have to say about the quality of the publication. Yeah. Uh, may I ask one more question? Uh, you mentioned about the incubation center that the university provide to student and staff. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please add a little bit on the service that you provide, you know, uh, because you know, some, some students are engineers and technical, technically trained. Yeah. They may not have uh, entrepreneurship. What, what kind of support that you provide to them, please? Yeah. I, 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 I am in charge in this activity. And my first priority is how to setting up one funding for the startup of my university. Okay, so by by this way, I will ask my uh, faculty member come to contact with the industry to gain some money, the support from the e industry, and we also come to the Ministry of Science and Technology to ask them support some money for this uh, funding. So I think that start with the funding and with the competition of the innovation idea, yeah? So we can get, uh, we, we, we can choose the, how say, the optimum idea uh, to make investment. And, and I, I hope that by this way, you can step by step uh, supporting the development of the startup in my university. So I think uh, we, we have listened to a very innovative talk yeah. from Professor Yen Huduk. So please show our appreciation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Spain, uh, Professor Manuel Nunes from Universidad Complutense de Madrid, Spain. Uh, Professor Nunes holds a doctorate degree in mathematics, computer science obtained in 1996, and a master degree in economics obtained in 2002. He is a professor in Department of Computer Science, sorry, Computer System and Programming. 
of the universe that computes the matrix spin. He is also a visiting professor at the School of Information System, Computing and Mathematics of Bruno University in the UK. Currently, Professor Nunes is mainly working in the area of formal methods for testing complex systems. He is also working on the use of formal methods in user modeling with an emphasis on collective intelligence. He has been teaching for almost 25 years. He is a member of the IEEE SMC Technical Committee on Computer National Inter Collective Intelligence and a member of the Board of Directors of the Taurus Summer School on Software Testing. Okay. Professor Nunes has published extensively and has served in more than 120 program committees of international conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Manuel Nunes. So first of all, uh, good afternoon. This is very difficult to be the last speaker of a session, so I'm going to do my best so that you don't sleep, or if you're already sleeping, I will blow my voice. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the, of the conference for having me here. It's really a pleasure, and it's really, really interesting. So here I am. I'm going to talk about where we are at my university, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, what we did so far, and what we can do in the future. So I hope that is useful. So first of all, I would like to start with a disclaimer. So what I'm going to say is what I think, not what my university thinks. It's the first time in a talk that I use a disclaimer, but usually I give scientific talk, but where I, well, probably I did the wrong theorems, but at least it's my own responsibility, but here, what I'm going to say is what I think. So it's not that I'm going to say lies or something, but uh, still. Uh, some of the claims might not be very politically correct, so I'm going to prefer that it's on my own. So I'm going to, to structure the, the talk in, in two parts. So uh, the first part of the talk will be what I said in the title. I will talk about UCM 4.0. And then I would like to, to finish my, my presentation with a reflection, if you want, on how it's going to affect the job, the job market, but especially in the case of the university, this new, uh, wrongly called probably revolution, better call it evolution, that we are going through. So first I would like to present my university. I will give you some notes. Then I will mention the main problems. I will just concentrate in three things that I think are the most important problems that we have in, the, in, the, in our university to, to implement uh, the 4.0 approach. And I will go through what we already did, and then I will finish with, with what we can do in the future. And in the second part of the talk, I will give you a personal view about how the job market, the, the current jobs that we have in the university can Chains can suffer, can become redundant, etc. So, first part. So, our university was founded in 1499 in Alcalá Henares. You can see Alcalá Henares, not Madrid, but hey, we, we took the university. We, we are still the, from the original place. So, Alcalá Henares is the city where Cervantes was born. Cervantes is the writer of our most famous book. Don Quixote, probably you know it. And then we were moving to Madrid in the 19th century. Madrid is, is probably famous for this club. Do you know what is that? Very good. Still, we have a better team in Madrid. So, Atletico Madrid. Yeah, I know we lost the last two finals against the champions against Real Madrid, but. 
life is tough. Uh, but yeah, we have two teams in Madrid. So, like most medieval studies in the beginning, our university concentrated in just four degrees, arts, liberal arts, law, mainly with a theological approach, theology and medicine. So, our university is, has been home to most of our Nobel Prizes. We have only eight Nobel Prizes in Spain, not many, but uh, seven of them were somehow involved with our university. Three of them were professors there. In particular, both Nobel Prizes in Medicine were professors in, in my university, and four of them were students. One of them had nothing to do, but one out of eight is not so bad. So, some, some notes, and I would like to, to mention the, this, these numbers because they will make sense afterwards with what I want to say. So we have uh, 77,000 students, and we are decreasing a little bit, not much, but you can see 10 years ago we were 88. When I was a student, uh, it, was, it was baby boom, it was probably more than 100,000 students in, in my university. It was yeah, it's a lot of people. So we have uh, almost 6,000 lecturers, also decreasing during the, during the last years, probably due to the crisis, because uh, when positions where somebody was going to retirement, the state wouldn't allow us to, to bring the position again back. So it was a small reduction in the number of, of lecturers, but it's, it's more important in the number of students. Probably the reduction in the number of students is not related to the crisis, just related to the, to the age pyramid, but this is notorious. So our university is, is, uh, is decreasing the size, but still is, is very big. But it's not only big in the number of students, in the number of, of lecturers, but shouldn't be a problem. If you have one million students in the law school, then probably you are easier to manage than if you have such a big structure. We have 26, 26 schools. Uh, we don't have everything, but almost. So I'm just naming the schools in the according to the number of students. So law school is is is, is massive. It's more. It's, it's really big. So journalism is big. Education is big. Economics is, is medium size. Philosophy, political science, medicine. Then we have math, physics, chemistry, arts. So we have then, later on, we have computer science. Computer science is very new to my university, and it's like a, a discontinuity, because it's the only engineering studies that we have. Well, now you know everything is called engineering. We have uh, mathematical engineering, chemistry engineering, I don't know, philosophy engineering, but uh, real engineering is, is computer science, and it's something very, very new. It's 25 years old. So it's really the only engineering studies that we have. Other than engineering and architecture, we, having, we have everything. You name it, we have it. So we have 184 departments. Uh, we are going through our policy of reduce, reducing the number of departments, what is makes sense. And in addition to that, because the medicine school is very, very big, we cooperate with, with uh, clinics and hospitals. So this is the, this is the thing. Uh, we have many schools, we have many Departments, we also teach a lot of different stuff. We have 71 bachelor degrees, 12 dual bachelor degrees. This is a, a very interesting idea, at least I, I like, but this is, I was commenting this with colleagues and they were looking at me very surprised, like, what is that? Why would you like to have two, a dual degree? I said, yeah, because you would like to study two degrees. You do it at the same time and you can, you don't need to pass twice uh, algebra and calculus or introduction to programming. So you just pass one. So. We have several examples that they are complementing each other. For instance, we have a double degree and dual degree in mathematics and computer science, uh, computer science, uh, law and business administration, math and economics, etc. We have 156 master degrees, this also sun, and we have uh, 57 doctorate degrees. So, a really a long variety. Uh, I said that my university is big, and I always thought that my university was big, and I was not proud. I think it's too big. But then I was checking, and is it that big? Not really. 
I mean, I was Googling, and according to Google, there is a university in Delhi with more than four million students. So we are nothing. In, in Bangladesh, uh, more than two million. In Turkey, almost two million, and I mean, you go on. So Vietnam, small universities. But it's good. It's easier to manage. And, well, okay, we are not, not that big compared to the rest of the world, but are we big compared to Spain? Not even that. Uh, the biggest university is this one, but this is a, a distance university, so that's why we have many students enrolled in this university. But other than that, yes, after this, we are the biggest university in, in Spain. So what's my point if we are not that big? The point is that uh, peculiarities of my university has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with the size, has to do with the heterogeneity. We are a very heterogeneous university and it's really difficult to do something that fits them all. So, and, and I think this is the main cause of, of the problems to implement University 4.0. So, obviously, some of these problems might not appear in the university, but if you are similar to us, then you will face similar problems. Lecturers. Many lecturers don't, do not use new technologies. Uh, I, I, starting with myself, uh, I think Professor Fossen said today that in mathematics, they still use uh, blackboard and chalk. Yeah. I teach discrete mathematics, and yeah, I confess, I do it. I have good reasons to do it, and it's, I'm going to tell you why I use, uh, I'm, I'm teaching several courses, it's the only one that I teach with, with Blackboard and Chalk. And okay, imagine discrete mathematics to first year students of computer science. Computer science students, what they have in mind is that they want to write code so that there will be something moving on the screen very fast and very nice, or this is what they really want to do. They don't really want to learn math, what for? So I'm teaching discrete mathematics. I'm a funny guy, and I make jokes, and, but still, I want to keep attention. How do I keep attention if I give them the slides? Ah, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So at least I force them to copy. Something will come into their brains, hopefully. I know it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very bad example, but yeah, when you're teaching mathematics in, in computer science, it, I, it works for me. So that's why, that's why I do it. But it's true, it's, I, I, I teach other courses and I have a slice for all of them. Uh, remember that I said that humanities are, are, are very important in my university, a big majority. But we have something else, and it's also related to what you said. When, I was, when you were giving the talk, I said, ah, I'm going to repeat this again. The average age in my university is high, very high. So around 25% of the, of, the, of the lecturers are older than 60. 60% of the lecturers are older than 50. And it's not only age, I understand. I mean, if, if, if you are in computer science, you are used to use computers from, when there were computers, <laughs> in the beginning one computer for the whole faculty, then one couple of computers. But if you are not that young, let's say not that young, and you are not used to have computers, then it's very difficult that some, a guy comes and tells you, hey, you have to prepare slides, you have to do, you, s you have to use Moodle for your courses, or you have to prepare a mock. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's shocking in these statistics is if we concentrate on, on the number of professors, what is this category? So around 11% of the total lecturers are, are professors. So, this, I, I, when I was computing, I, I have to run the numbers twice. 97% of them are older than uh, 50. Uh, so I belong to this 3%, 3% younger than 50, two, two years to go. And it's, it's really, really, I mean, this. There are 18 guys out of more than 600 that are less than 50. And I can tell you, out of these 18, at least six are in the computer science school. So we are really 
located in the same building. So changes, you want changes. Uh, even worse, not only we are old and we work in humanities, we are civil servants, permanent civil servants. I mean, if you look at this, uh, almost half of the, of the lecturers in my university are, are permanent civil servants. And in this 53% that are not permanent civil servants, a big proportion are permanent. Not civil servants, they have a permanent contract. So let's put it together. So humanities, old people, uh, we are tenure permanent civil servants. Th doesn't look very good. I mean, it, 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 it will be very, 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 very difficult that, that we implement changes. Because what for? Again, uh, it can be even worse. Because now we look at this, our students. Yeah, our students. They are young. They use uh, phones. They use phones better and faster than me, of course. They, it's only a couple of, I wouldn't say a couple of years, a couple of months that I took this thing that I see in my students. When you, want, when you look at something and you want to write down, I look for a ball pen and a, and a paper. They take a picture. It makes sound stupid, but it's something that is, I mean, the first thing when I have to write something, I look for a ball pen. I don't look for the phone, but they will do it like this. And I'm getting used, not completely, but it's, it's something that is, they are used. They were, as you said, they were born with a phone in the hand. Uh, yeah, but this doesn't imply that they use new technologies. This doesn't imply that they can use Word or Excel. Uh, let me tell you a, a story. So I was teaching in the economics school uh, 10 years ago, something like that, and we have a course in introduction to, to informatics. Uh, initially, we were teaching how to program, how to write small programs in Pascal. It was very difficult, they didn't pass, so we decided to change the, the course. And when I, was when I was teaching, we were teaching them how to use Word and Excel. Not computer science, but hey, still. Uh, so I'm going through the, through the computers, and I see one student, she's typing something in Word, and she's using the capital letters, and she will use the, she will lock, the, the, the caps lock, she will press, one click, and unlock. Then again, so clicking cap locks, and like, excuse me, what are you doing? And she's like very, very much offended. I said, I have to write a capital letter. I said, yeah, but you have the other one, the one below, you just press for one letter. She didn't know. Obviously, she never used a typewriter, but it's okay. We are all fashioned, like can type with eight fingers. Not this two for the, so, yeah, so she didn't know that there were two ways of making capital letters, one that it will be just pressing, one time and one keep it pressed. So it was really, I was really shocking. And then I took a keyboard and I was explaining to everybody, hey, if you want to just press one, you don't need to, 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 to do the, the locking. So this shows that, that, that we cannot expect our students in general to know about computers and stuff like that. But this is sad. So after this situation, <laughs> that it doesn't look very good, I must confess. Uh, are we still doing something to, to modernize our university? We are, we are doing, we are doing things. So this is what I would like to, to go now through. So things that we have already done. So I'm going to split in the three parts, teaching, research, and administration. In teaching, we are enforcing the wide use of a virtual campus as Moodle courses. Enforcing, promoting, uh, asking, please. But we are, we are in on the way. So in this case, uh, lecturers, if you are not used to these Moodle courses, they publish their material for the courses, and, and there you can give grades, you can make announcements about the courses. So the students can access the material they are always vicious, and yeah, they, they, they have a versatile communication channel, which is always good. 
uh, we, the university provides courses for both online and classroom, brick and mortar, uh, to improve the, the students' knowledge of basic computer tools. And in addition to that, we, we offer many online degrees, mainly at the master level, or I would say only at the master level, not at the bachelor level. So we are doing stuff. Concerning administration, I would like to be more positive, but yeah, you know, administration paperwork. Uh, bureaucracy is a, is a French war, but we are very close to France, so <laughs> probably we are not that bad. We are, I mean, bureau bureaucracy in France is, is, is really horrible, but we are just horrible, yeah, but same thing. Uh, electronic resources are slowly, very slowly, painfully slowly replacing paper. We can perform some routine procedures via uh, the institutional web website. So we can ask for certificates, we can upload the grades of the students, uh, we can apply for positions in our university, these things. You can do, you can do online, but not much more than that. So, Students can also perform some of the procedures online. They can, they can uh, assess the grades. They can apply for enrollment in new courses. These things they can do. Uh, they can communicate with the administration of the university online, but still painfully slowly. Lot of paper. It's, for instance, when, when I grade my students, I can do it online. I will give the marks there, and, but then, I have to print the marks and I have to sign. No. In Spain, we have the digital signature. I mean, I can, uh, when I pay tax, I can pay taxes online. And when I pay, pay taxes online, I just need to, to give a, you know, with the web page, you identify, blah, 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 and there's a digital signature. Why we cannot use the same thing in the university? Why do I still have to print the paper and sign? So. 21st century university with 19th century technologies, not even 20th century. There were computers in the 20th century, most of it. Uh, research. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's getting better. So we can do some, some interactions with the university by online. Research group are public, and you can update information about the research group mainly through your own web page, but you also have some institutional web pages. Uh, we can, principal investigators can do some tasks to help managing of funds uh, till, I don't know, what was this, five, six years ago, I, I couldn't access the funds that I have. If I wanted to have a list of the expenses that I have done to a certain project, I have to go to a central service and say, hey, can I get a printout? Now I can, at least I can access these things. But still, when I apply for a, when I make a payment order, I have to sign in paper, but at least we are, we are getting better. And when we have to apply for a project, for a grant, then at least the university is doing this online. But this is good. So you might be thinking, and I think that you said it's familiar, so is this that new? And yeah, it's, it's new to me. Yeah, now, when, when we think about things that we take for granted now, they were not always there. I mean, I still remember the first time that I was sitting beside a guy in a, in a seminar. It was in Dachstuhl, yeah, many years ago. And, and the guy was accessing the internet with his computer without cables. And he was looking like, what are you doing? Yeah, and then he has a laptop and very bulky thing plugged to the laptop. That this was, what, 16 years ago, 15 years ago? So not, not 200 years ago. I mean, this Wi-Fi, like, like now, this was not there always. I mean, when, when, I, became, when I entered the university in, in, in the end of 92, I was an assistant teacher. I have a, an email, but I couldn't write anybody. Nobody has an email address, so I could only write colleagues. I mean, nobody has an email address, nobody had the internet at home, so it was, it was quite useless outside academia. In academia was very useful, but outside academia, email, I mean, you couldn't send an email to your mom, hey mom, I'm fine. This didn't work. So these changes are not that 
that, that old. So when was the first time that you were able to grade your students online? If you think it's probably not even 10 years, it's probably not even, it's probably not even five. So when was the first time that you were using Moodle? What, six, seven years, eight. When was the first time that you could get a teaching certificate? Well, I tell you, in my case, it's not so, so oh, many years ago. So when was the first time that you could have paperless apply for a grant? Okay, in all honesty, I can do that, not yet. But it could be good, but we are not there. So these things that you might think that are many years ago, and actually they are not, is because probably we are using a wrong word. And this is something that we know in economists usually don't talk about the industrial revolution. It's a nice term, but it was not a revolution. It was an evolution. Think, think about the first industrial revolution. So if you want to give a date, what is very nice, you think about the steam engine, 1783. But it was not like one day you wake up and say, hey, here we are, industrial revolution. It was something more progress, it took longer. So probably started with the first steam engines in the beginning of the 18th century and probably ended, finished around 1820s. In the 1820s, probably because they, they were already starting the, the second industrial revolution. So if you think about the, something that takes 100, more than 100 years, would you call this a revolution? So it's, it's really, it's, it's an evolution process. And why do we say that the first industrial revolution ended in the 1820s? Probably because it's the beginning of David Ricardo's papers on division of labor and specialization of, of countries. So if you think of the second industrial revolution, yeah, we think, okay, fourth assembly line, but probably started much, much before. If we want to give a date, probably in the 1870s, 1860s, with the development of the railway, of the electricity, and finish around the beginning of the First World War. So again, a shorter revolution, but not a revolution, not something that takes 50 years to, to develop. So my point is, we don't feel that the changes are that new because it's not a cut, it's not a break, it's taking progressive, evolving a long time. The same we can say for the third industrial revolution, fourth, fifth, I don't know which one we are, now we are in fourth. Okay, well, fifth, sixth, it's probably the same. But it's always taking shorter. Okay, so the third industrial revolution is 69 till what? Uh, 1980s, 12 years or 15 years, but still it's taking, taking time, not, not one day, not from one day to the other. So what we can do in the future? in my university. So despite all the problems that I was mentioning, we are still working on that. And at this point, I would like to thank, because I also was looking for material. And I wanted to know, what are we doing something? Do we have a plan? And I was contacting the vice chancellor, and he was very nice. And he was helping me with, with the, telling me what we are doing, at least from, from the innovation point of view. So it's, it's very nice. And I would like to thank for his help. So, Briefly mention the main question lines that we are doing and uh, mention more ambitious work that we could do in the future. So in teaching, we are starting a specific program to develop MOOCs, both in Spanish platforms and in international platforms. So we are promoting the universal use of the virtual campus, this developing of Moodle courses. Uh, I said before that we are, we, we are getting there we want to get more than there. I mean, not probably not 100% of the courses, but as many as possible. So we are promoting innovative techniques and the using new technologies, new technologies in teaching. And one thing for the globalization is we are promoting the creation of, of, of degrees in English. This is a controversy. Why would you go to study in Spain, in English, when you can go to the UK or you can go to the USA. Yeah, but we are very popular with Erasmus students, so it's good that when they come, they can take some courses in, in English, at least in the beginning, so that they get used to the language. 
and also is a way of attracting of, of attracting other students. So we are promoting this the courses in English. So to expand the market, if you want to call it, we, in Spain we, we we always have traditionally have a, a big market with South America. The students will come because they speak the, the same language, and we would like to go to expand to grow the this thing to other markets. So administration, we are starting a master plan to promote e-administration, again, as much as possible. The idea is that most formalities and most exchanges of information can be done via internet. Uh, this is interesting, uh, the vice chancellor was mentioning that we are in the process of developing an application to, to generate a more effective communication with the students. Don't know the details, but I thought it was interesting to mention. And we are developing an integrated system to include all the institutional data. Of course, now the governing bodies of the university have access to all the data, but it is really dispersed. So the idea is to put them together so that when they have to take decisions, it is easier for them. It makes a lot of sense. So they want to integrate data into a common platform. Research. It could be good. Uh, the idea would be to, to include uh, formalities related to management in, in the e-administration program, getting there. We are building a very big, yeah, because everybody has a cluster of a very, very big computer cluster for data intensive experiments. Uh, take into account that, yeah, computer science is small, but we have a very big medicine school and, and some of them doing research in medicine. Some of them doing research in, in biology, they, they need a lot of computation power, so the idea is to centralize information there and we can communicate. This is a very interesting initiative that is, the Man University is, is putting in practice. It's, it's, it's the second year this year. I, I like it very much. It's not much money, because there is not much money any, anyway. But it's the promotion of research projects of groups in the university, but you need three research groups in three different departments. So it really, if you want this money, either for your CV or because you want some spare money to buy a couple of machines, you need to get in contact with people from other departments, from other faculties, and you need to, to have a common research project. Of course, you cannot expect that you are going to prove that P is not equal to MP or something like that, because, but it's good that you collaborate with different projects. For instance, one, uh, one person in my group is running a project and is coordinated with a group in mathematics and a group in medicine and our group in computer science, but it's very good. It's very good that at least people talk to each other. So it's, I, I really like this, this idea of putting together people with different backgrounds and different research interests. So uh, for the future, and this is uh, my own creation, what I think we should try to do. Okay. We should try to, to go in serious games from, res from research to teaching. We have some research group working on serious games and probably we can move then, we can apply them to, to teaching. Lifelong learning, we really could be there. We could be there for companies when they want to learn something new, cutting edge technologies, we could be there to, to form them, we could be there to, to teach them, it's something that we don't do now. When we have our degrees, bachelor's degrees, we have our master's degrees, but master's degrees sometimes are just like a continuation of the bachelor degrees and we should be focusing or we should be trying to, to get this niche of the market. This is a dream, I know, but paperless management, I will be so happy. And ways of communicating students, lecturers and supporting staff through, through new channels. This will be something that we should pursue as much as possible. This with 100% with of this one, I will be happy. Yes, I, can, I, I can remove the other three, but paperless, it will be something. So let me go to the second part of my talk. I am on time. Very good. It's always good to be in time. So it's, it's, this is really worrying. I mean, university in, in industry, industry 4.0 is really worrying a lot of actors. It's, this was, uh, when I started to prepare this talk, it was very interesting that, okay, this is our, our report that they prepared for the President of the United States. Look at the date, December 
2016, one month before he went home, so on the role of artificial intelligence in the automation and the economy. So the executive summary was mentioning that, yeah, AI capabilities will enable automation, but the way this is going to impact in unemployment and inequality is something that it is still to know. There will be unemployment, and unemployment brings inequality. During this crisis, the Gini coefficient has deteriorated in many countries. In Spain, has really increased a lot. So it's really inequalities are, are, are increasing, and there will be more with this. So what, what measures they can take to, to minimize this or to reduce this? So they identify three strategies, and I'm going to mention the one that is more related to us. Educate and train Americans for jobs of the future. So they already know, OK, there's going to be unemployment, so let's teach them something that they can do in the future, not what they can do now. You may say, yeah, United States has nothing to do with us. OK, this is a little bit closer. Asian in Transformation is a report of the International Labor Organization in July 2016. And the conclusions are not, also not very good concerning the job market. Uh, almost 60% of the, of the jobs might be automatized. And this will have a lot of impact, mainly in women and workers with low education, workers that are having lower wages. So this is going to produce inequality. Conclusions of the report something similar with a different wording, but similar to what we said we saw before in a completely different context. A report to the President of the United States, a report by the International Labor Organization for Asian Countries. Government and education and training providers need to actively anticipate for automation impacts. We could be there. We are universities. We should be there. We should do something. So you might be wondering, but how does this affect us? Yeah, we cannot expect that this is not going to affect us, our jobs. Probably we are too old to see this, at least this part. Right over there, you will be more affected with that. Uh, but something is going to happen. I found this is a, it's a website where you say what this your job and they give you the probability of your job being redundant. So related to university, if you are in if you are an archivist in education, then the probability of being automated is seventy five percent. It's not good. If you are a li librarian, it's sixty five percent. When was the last time that you were to a library with I mean like with paper and not very often. Well probably I, I go once a year because I have a couple of paper books and every year they do an, they do the counting so they have to check that you didn't eat the book and that's it they go once a year to the to the library so and what if you're a bookkeeper geez it looks very bad this is 98 percent yeah if you're a college professor it's only 3.2 so why why should we worry <laughs> if we are not None of them? No. Yeah, we mathematicians, we are also happy. It's unlikely that we will be automatized. Not that we do something very important for the future of the world, but hey, we do difficult stuff. Uh, no big deal. Still, we are university lecturers, and the probability of our job to, to disappear is slow. Are you sure it's that low? Uh, not. So let me just give you why and a little bit more pessimistic. So think how interactive you are with your students. OK, don't think. Because human beings are, are not very critical with ourselves. So think about other lecturers, not about yourself, but in other departments. So have in mind, I know these guys in the department. so. Are they doing something very different from reading a book? 
I mean, if they have slides, they, some of them are just reading the slides. If they have a blackboard or a chalk, they are just copying their own notes that are really yellow for the years that they, are, that they were passing. So can they be replaced by automatic readers with some basic capabilities to answer simple questions? Yeah, it looks very likely, right? So this is, this is not going to happen to us, it's to the other, to the other lecturers, not to us. We are very good and we communicate with other students. But think about the other, the other ones are probably being unlucky. So wrapping up, it is very likely that the staff currently working in the university will be redundant. Librarians, bookkeepers. So all these guys, I mean, these jobs are going to, be dis to disappear or, or almost disappear. It is, li it is also likely that some if not many lecturers will be replaced by, by intelligent robots. Uh, I'm thinking in robots like that, not, not like that. So this kind of robots, no, don't be scared. Uh, we will have mocks. We'll have serious games. We'll have new approaches that we don't know even yet. So with this situation, that it looks more or less like Terminator. So can we do something? So yeah, we should prepare likely redundant administrative staff to, to train for new jobs. This is more a desire than a reality. Remember, I don't know, but half of them will be uh, permanent civil servants. So like Professor Fossen said, they, they will say, what? We should prepare likely redundant lecturers, not ourselves, are very clever, and we prepare, but the other ones to, to move from classroom to alternatives. So, specific proposal. Lecturers know about the specific topics. They know how to, to prepare material for, for courses. I mean, I can give notes and I can say, hey, you have to take this, put more emphasis on this, put more emphasis on that. What we are very bad is in preparing funny material, entertaining material, videos. I don't know anybody, not a professional video editor, who can make a video more than 20 seconds without being boring, very boring. Think about uh, this wedding video where you are watching their pass, people passing by. When they are made by a professional guy, they are very boring. When they are doing by your brother-in-law, they are horrible. So it's, we, we are not. Uh, video editors. We are not. Uh, we are not good for for making contents. Uh, and these guys that they would be redundant. They might prepare to to do video editing. Uh, it cannot be that tough. I'm not saying. I mean, not Francis Ford Coppola or, or Steven Spielberg, but something good. They could be trained to do. So we could. This could be a way of putting together all these people that are likely to be redundant in, in the near future to do something that it will be going towards these new approaches. So, conclusions. It's easier to do changes when you have a small universities, young lecturers, and with technical studies. <laughs> My university is a big university with relatively old, relatively with old lecturers, and where humanities are a majority. So. Still, we have taken some measures. We have an extensive use of the virtual campus. We are starting with internationalization. We are promoting e-administration. I have a master plan to, to take more measures in the near future. The implementation of University 4.0 will produce a shift in the job market. If we don't see it, then we are not looking at the problem. And we should take measures to, to transform redundant jobs into new jobs. So that's all I wanted to say almost on time. Two minutes more than, according to this thing, is 42 minutes my presentation. So thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, t 12 years ago, I went to Alcala 
And there was a big university, very big. Yeah, there is a new university now. Is it your university? No. No. <laughs> Not that one. Okay, it, it was like this. So Alcalá Henares was the original university. Uh -huh. Then the university in the 19th century moved to Madrid. Uh -huh. Then there was no university in Alcalá. And then in the 80s, 70s, 80s, uh, the 1970s, 1980s, University of Alcalá was funded. I see. Of uh -huh. course, they will say that, and actually they are partially right, that they are the inheritors of the old university, but they have a 400, gap, 400 years gap in the middle. I see. Uh, uh, you mean talk, mainly talk about uh, challenge and change, handling change, okay. Uh, I think I'm, I'm one of the older people in my university, perhaps the oldest one. <laughs> And I welcome change, but you know, we, we have no resistance to change, but we need support, I think. We need support. And some universities provide support for these change, like for example, how to uh, produce video materials and teaching materials. Uh, um, may I ask first, sorry, uh, please add a little bit more on the support that university provide to these changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, it's, it's essentially this is what I said in my, in, in my last slide. We, if we will have support, but not only older people or, or anybody, I mean, if you are 25 years old and you are first assistant teacher, it would be good that somebody is helping you to develop contents. Yeah, we need support, but do we have support? Not really, so if we are the only ones, the, the ones who have to prepare contents, it is easier for somebody with a technical background to prepare contents, digital contents, than for somebody with a working, I don't know, in archaeology or in, in biblical studies. So it, it will be very difficult for them. So this, yeah, but of course, if the university will support, it will be good. great. I agree. Okay, please, sir. Well, thank you for your entertaining talk. Um, it's very reassuring to see that we have very similar problems, although we are only half the size of uh, UCM. And we didn't talk about it. <laughs> and we didn't talk about it, yeah. I wonder whether old universities like yours or mine have a similar problem like big companies. Like I think of companies like IBM or Siemens in Germany. Compared to startups, disruptors, are younger universities who are only 20, 25 years old, are they able to do better than us? Are they able to change faster than us? Are they able to avoid the mistakes that, that we might have made in the, in the past? What do you think? I'm not sure. I will say if, for instance, in, in Madrid, we have a university on technical studies. It's just technical studies. It's everything engineering and architecture. So they are more homogeneous. But new universities are also expanding across Humanities, law, medicine, computer science, so they will face similar problems. And Probably just, just repeat the, the, the mistakes that have been made a hundred times already. Yeah, because yeah. They, when they were created, they, I, I don't think it will be the, the new university. Only if they, are, if they are, I think the problem is not big, it's not old, it's heterogeneous, homogeneous. I think this is the problem for, implement, for implementing something at the whole scale. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, can you come back to the, your last slide, please? Yes, here. Uh, you say that uh, uh, a great part of your university is the medicine. This is not a good argument to be, uh, to no uh, development university 4.0. Do you agree with me? Because with medicine, you have to use uh, new technology. It's a challenge. Yes. Right? But why you do not use? <laughs> no, no. I'm, what I'm saying is that humanities is a big part, and medicine also is a big part. I didn't say that medicine is part of the problem. I said that I wanted to point out that it's not only humanities in my university. But still, one said this. Medicines, medical. Can you stop recording now? <laughs> Yeah, you know, they are, uh, sometimes uh, my, my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, he had an expression, it was very good. And when he wanted to refer to somebody who was, you know, like 
arrogant or something like that, he will call it the God's boss. So yeah, sometimes when you talk to medical doctors, yeah, they are like God's boss. And yeah, it, I'm not sure that you can convince them how to manage new things. I mean, if they feel like, like doing, they do it. Uh, for instance, I, I, I have a very good friend working in, the, in another university, but in, the, in the medicine. And they have these simulators, but it was very funny, the expression, when she was using the word simulator, for me, computer science simulator is something completely different. But for them, it's a, it's, a, it's a dummy. So where you will perform operation, surgery, stuff like that, but this is like a plastic thing and simulates the human body. So they are using new technologies, no, no, no question about it, but still, we are civil servants, permanent civil servants, complicate things. Okay, any more questions? May, may I ask a little bit? Uh, please add a bit more on the active learning activities in your university, please. Do you have such thing? Mm. Active learning, flip classroom? It really depends on, on, on the lecturer. It really depends on the professor. And again, coming back to, to the first talk of the, of the day, younger people will, will promote more interactive learning strategies, the students will have to do more things outside the classroom, but it's not enforced, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a common strategy to, 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 to promote active learning, as we understand it. Yeah. Uh, to my experience, you know, one of our problems in my university, and in Thailand actually, is that we are afraid of being replaced by our own self. You know what I mean? For active learning, you have to record your lectures. Hmm. And instead of asking you to give lecture, they replay your videos. Yeah. <laughs> and you no longer hide. And that video could go anywhere in YouTube, and nobody invites you for special lectures anymore. <laughs> Do you have that problem? Yeah, let me tell you at all. Uh, a, a joke is 30 years old, as you guys will see. So there is this professor, he's always teaching every year the same thing, every year teaching the same thing, and then he says, hey, why should I come here? Why I don't record my, my talk with a, with a tape recorder? And I just press the tape recorder. So the guy will go one year and say, okay, here is the tape recorder, and there will be my lecture, so you come every year, he will replace the, the tape, and then the students will come there, and they will take notes, the same thing. Till one day, he comes, and there is nobody in the classroom, but there are tape recorders in all the tables. So, yeah. We can replace the we can replace they can replace us via video and then they will replace the students by just pressing the, the button. Okay, it seems like we don't have any more questions. So thank you very much, Professor Nunes. Thank you. So uh, this uh, session is closed and let you announce. So thank you very much for the ending of the section three. Tomorrow the uh, conference will begin at 8 a.m. And uh, Mr. Tom will pick the keynote speaker and the chair at the Liberty Hotel at 7 p.m. 7 a.m. Thank you very much. Okay, so due to uh, um, tomorrow is going to be early at 7 a.m. So I will make some adjustment. going to be around 7.15, 7.30 a.m. in the morning tomorrow.